Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Real Me In, colon, a movie podcast where you didn't really ask for it, but hey, I'm going to give it to you anyways. This is a podcast where I talk about anything, everything, and well, anything about movies. I'm your host, Chase Lee, and hey guys, listen, if you were searching on the web for some weird, I don't know, like undercover, like creepy Donald Trump tape and you accidentally came across my podcast and you're not a movie fan, well, hopefully I can convince you to be one. This is episode 151, guys. I, uh, If you are new to the show, welcome once again. What I do on the show is I will go over some movie news uh, and movie trailers that drop throughout the week. I will have my review of a specific film that comes out on the, uh, the, you know, the weekend and, uh, of course, box office results for the weekend. Uh, this week's going to be a little different. Uh, I am recording this on a Thursday night, so you guys get three whole days early. How does that sound? It applies, anyone? No? No one listens to this? This fuck fest of a podcast. Oh, okay. Anyways, um, my girlfriend's coming into town, and uh, I promised her no podcasting or YouTube uh, while uh, she was here because you know we're a long distance, and I want to spend time with her and stuff. So, you know, I was like, I gotta get all my shit done early. So this is why you guys are getting this uh, three days in advance. So you're welcome. But uh, for the next two weeks uh, in October will be normal time on Sunday, but you guys get a little extra sum sum this week. Uh, But this week, uh, I will go over movie news, trailers, uh, no box office results, like I said, and I will have my review of The Accountant, and I will have a brief mini review of another movie I saw, but I won't go into like detail or anything, but I'll give you uh, my score on it and just uh, a brief kind of a uh, little overall review. So there's a little, there's a surprise review and the accountant. So but first how you guys doing? You guys doing pretty good? Uh it's been an interesting week for sure. Uh the last week's episode, I want to thank you guys a lot. It was uh, a really well received episode. So thank you for all the people that commented and uh participated in that discussion. Um so yeah, without any further ado, let's get started. Let's move on to some movie news. All right. So there's only three stories that dropped. Um this week, it was kind of a slow news week, and to be quite frank with you, it was quite, kind of a slow trailer week. Hollywood just decided to go fucking hibernate somewhere in the Himalayas and never be heard from again. So, uh, the first story I want to talk about is that Forrest Whitaker, and this is all going to tie in because, you know, he's also in Rogue One, and that trailer just dropped, and I'll be talking about that as well. But, Forrest Whitaker, uh, the story is that he's going to join Black Panther. Now, this is going to be the film directed by Ryan Coogler, uh, starring Chadwick Boseman as the uh, the superhero, and uh, Michael B. Jordan's going to be in this, and now Forrest Whitaker. I mean, this is starting to become like a really strong um, uh, cast, and I'm really just looking forward to it. And I I get excited every time when they bring on another. Uh, uh, you know, actor or actress to this project because it, it just is shaping up to be a very, uh, what it seems to be like a very deep, compelling superhero movie, uh, which is, you know, we, have, we haven't really gotten a lot of those. Um, yeah, Civil War tapped into more of the darker, more dramatic stuff, but I think with what Ryan Coogler is going to bring, he's going to bring a lot of depth to this character. He's going to bring a lot of gravitas and a lot of pathos to this uh, uh, character who's the events that happened in Civil War is going to drive him and shape him and mold him. I'm not going to spoil it because the movie just came out. Um, but, you know, he's the director of Fruitvale Station and the uh, monster hit Creed from last year. So I'm really excited to see what he does with all of these actors and actresses and how he directs them and pulls out the best performances and whatnot. And Forrest Whitaker... You're just adding talent, baby. I mean, come on. And uh, I- I'm sure Kevin Feige was on the set of Rogue One and was just like, yeah, yeah, you do pretty well in Black Panther, Mr. Whitaker. Uh, so, uh, yeah, no, uh, that- that's fantastic news. Adding talent is never a bad thing, but this is shaping up to be wanting, uh, to be one of my most anticipated Marvel movies out of their entire slate, so should be pretty good. Uh, the next story I want to talk about, I don't know why this is a thing. Uh, I, I mean, I know why, but I don't know why. Let me explain myself. So the story is, is that Bad Dads is coming. Now, you're probably thinking to yourself, oh, my God, Chase. Well, what is this two-bit Walmart movie that you speak of? 
Well, I hate to break it to you, but it's actually going to come in theaters. So Bad Dads is going to be a spinoff of the uh, successful uh, hit um, Bad Moms. Now, Bad Moms, I think, costs like $20 million and it grossed like 162 worldwide or something crazy like that. So it makes total sense that they would create a spinoff. However, the appeal about Bad Moms was that they were housewives. They were, you know, single mothers. They were workaholics. They were something we hadn't really seen before with a a female-led movie, which is why, uh, that's why it felt kind of fresh and stuff with all the, the raunch that was going on in the film. When you do Bad Dads, that's pretty much just making like a hangover movie. So I don't. I mean, I get it. Makes money. You want to do some spinoffs. Good for you. Pat on the back. I'll give you a, a gold medal afterwards. But just having having a spinoff called Bad Dads doesn't really get me impressed at all. Because Bad Moms was okay. It's not like it was the best thing in the world. But out of all the comedies during the summer, it was pretty passable, I guess. Um, it definitely stood out amongst the crowd. But... Bad Dad, it just seems like desperation um, milking that, you know, money cow udder as dry and hard as you can. So that way you can just squeeze everything out of this franchise that you can possibly get. And it just, it just, I don't know, it just sounds bad all around, to be honest with you. I'm not looking forward to it. But all the people that enjoy Bad Moms, uh, that that story is for you. Uh, maybe you'll see Bad Dads. Maybe it will be a surprise hit like Bad Moms. I have no clue, but just from on the surface, it just reeks of desperation and money grubbing and it um, doesn't really add anything new to anything. So um, Bad Dads coming your way. Uh, and the last piece of news, which is probably the weirdest fucking piece of news this week, is that they're going to make a live-action Aladdin. I, I know you're probably thinking to yourself, well, Chase, that's pretty fucking weird. No, that's not the weird story, but uh, because, you know, Disney is remaking all of their animated uh, movies. I mean, last week we talked about The Lion King and, you know, Mulan's got a date in place. Beauty and the Beast is coming out. So, you know, they're going to remake everything into a live action. Aladdin is on that docket. The story was, is that Guy Ritchie is, was, or is, or was in talks. I'm going to say is, because I think it was present. He is in talks to direct it. What? That is so fucking weird, man. And and listen, I think Guy Guy Ritchie is full of talent. I mean, if you look at movies like um, Snatch or Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels, it's just the guy is a really kind of unique filmmaker creating these weird, eccentric uh, movies with really kind of... um, colorful characters and just have such a fun vibe to them. They're so fastly paced and they're really well edited and they just keep you entertained throughout the entire thing. Snatch. I didn't know what to expect. I blind bought it and I was completely surprised and I'm so glad I own it now because it is a fantastic uh, little film that he did. But I haven't really cared for the Sherlock Holmes movies and I didn't see the man from uncle, but it looks like he's going to get another shot with this. I don't know what the hell this movie is going to look like now that he is in talks. Now, if he gets the gig, I mean, I don't, I, I'm baffled. I honestly don't know what the hell that movie would look like. Um, but having Guy Ritchie on, if you want to think about some of the positives, because that's what the show is about. It's positivity, everyone. No negativity in this bitch. So, if Guy Ritchie is doing it, he's going to add a certain amount of energy to Aladdin. I mean, Aladdin is a, you know, little thief. (laughs) So, um, it kind of bodes well with, uh, all the characters that Guy Ritchie has played with in all of his movies in the past. So I don't know, maybe he can inject some really kind of lively energy into it that it desperately needs. Maybe he went into that pitch meeting. He pitched it. and Disney was like, well, God damn Guy Ritchie. This sounds fucking adorable. You're gonna you're gonna direct this movie, so I I don't know. Maybe he had a great idea for it, but um, on the surface it's weird. But when you think about it, hey, Guy Ritchie's got a lot of talent. I think he can inject some flavor into this uh, uh, property. So I'm 
down, I guess. I we'll see. <laughs> I gotta see a trailer first. But uh, that's it for the news, guys. Kind of a slow news week, like I said. I apologize. Hollywood is uh, they just packed up shop and left. They just said fuck it, I'm done, and they just left. Um, and the two trailers that came out this two two fucking trailers, guys. Two trailers came out this week. Number one is directed by Larry Charles, and he directed Borat, Bruno, The Dictator. So basically, uh, Sasha Baron Cohen's uh, uh, movies. This one, Army of One, is about the real-life story of a guy who uh, had a vision from God, and God basically told him that uh, he needed to go kill Osama bin Laden. Um... That sounds cool, but the main character is actually played by Nicolas Cage, which you add some of that bat shit insanity to um, a movie, especially with a real life character like that. It's it's like borderline almost perfect casting. So uh, the trailer looks weird. It looks uh, very fun and just crazy. And I don't know. I'm. I'm kind of looking forward to it. I'm, I'm into some weird movies, guys. Uh, if you see my movie collection, I mean, hell, I mean, I, I can't think of any right off the bat, but I got some weird shit in there. I mean, I think Alvin and the Chipmunks is in there somewhere, and I, I might, that might be a guilty pleasure. But, you know, it, it, for this one, Nicolas Cage, to me, he is definitely a hit and miss. There's no doubt about that. I mean, he's in so many bad movies that are so bad it's good. It you almost can forgive the guy because at least they're entertaining and they don't, you know, they, they can um, occupy your time on a drunk Saturday night while you're in your boxers. So, I mean, I get it. I get his appeal. And when he does movies like Adaptation or I hear he's very good in, um, uh, oh, shit, Bad Lieutenant, all these, like, great uh, roles I've I've heard that he's been in, it just kind of shows you that uh, Joe, there you go. That's what I was thinking of. Joe with Ty Sheridan. You know he's got the chops. It's just you know when you lose a lot of money, you gotta pretty much take what you can get, and that's pretty much what he had to do. So uh, he's been kind of on a uh, a bumpy road the past five years. Had some good ones and some very bad ones, but with this one, I think him playing like a real life character. Um, that was, uh, just as crazy cause you know, he had a vision to go kill o- Osama. Um, I think it, it's like a perfect match. So it looks crazy. It looks like it's got like that Borat kind of touch to it. So I'm down, I guess. So, uh, it looks fun. Um, and the last trailer and the one that you guys want me to talk about because I have no fucking clue why I told you guys I'm not a Star Wars fan, but I will continue to watch these trailers because I'm dedicated to you guys. So, Rogue One, A Star Wars Story, uh, just released their final trailer this morning. Now, like I told you guys, not the biggest Star Wars fan. I did appreciate The Force Awakens, and I think the other movies are fun. They're they're nice little sci-fi galaxy adventures and you're probably shaking your head and you probably want to come hunt me down with a pitchfork and you're probably like chase you're such a goddamn idiot all you like is comic book movies and stuff and yeah that's kind of my star wars but i'm judging these trailers on how well they're constructed how well they're shot how well they're um acted and uh how well the visual effects look and i gotta tell you this final trailer from rogue one a star wars story it's pretty dope. I'm not going to lie. It's it's visually beautiful, guys. Like, uh, Listen, I own A New Hope, and I've seen Empire, and I've seen Return, and I've seen the prequels, and I've seen Force Awakens. But there's something about the way this one looks. The visual effects look so crisp and so clear. I, I, I feel like they're using a different uh, uh, system than... Uh, they did for Force Awakens. It's almost like they upgraded to like the, the most high def quality. The visual effects look so well done and so grandiose, and they're such on a, a large scale. It just invites you into this universe, and I loved all the actors in it: Mads Mikkelsen, Forrest Whitaker, Felicity Jones. Hell, even um, 
Oh, what's his name? Diego Luna was pretty good in this trailer. Ben Mendelsohn, for God's sake. Everyone looks like they're on point in terms of the acting and stuff. That's no problem. But the cinematography is beautiful. They pick some of the most wild locations, and it's just so uh, beautiful and interesting to look at. And it's like a it's like a a painting. And I, I know most of it's probably green screen and whatnot, but it, who cares? It's blended in so well with the real environments and the sets and stuff. It looks like you are transported to another world, and that's what I really appreciate about these Star Wars movies is that you feel like you're into this world, and it doesn't feel like Earth or anything. It's just a nice uh, departure, and it really does provide that escape that you're looking for, and um, this one does just that. It looks like it's going to be dark. It looks like it's going to be intense. It looks like it's going to be a war film. It's just there's so much about it. That actually gets me excited more than any other Star Wars movie has in the past. And I'm not the biggest fan. But from the cinematography, the acting, the overall tone, and just how it's probably going to end with a bunch of sacrifices and death, I am super stoked to see this um, uh, when it comes out December 16th. So, Disney, fuck me sideways. You you, you did it. You have won me over. Now I want to see Rogue One, a Star Wars story. Thank you. So that will do it for the trailers, guys. Kind of a slow trailer week. Um, yeah, so what was your favorite news story or trailer that came out? Comment in the place that's right below my face and let me know. So let's move on to the main course, guys. This is going to be a short episode. I'm telling you, there was literally no- cherry picking, cherry picking, guys, from stories and trailers. It was just that slow. But let's get into the main course of the show, which is the accountant. And, uh, you know, when I saw the trailers to this movie, I was really looking forward to it. Ben Affleck, Anna Kendrick, John Bernthal, John Lithgow, uh, Jeffrey uh, Tambor, um, J.K. Simmons, StatCast, directed by Gavin O'Connor, who did Miracle, which I did see. Really like it. Great Kurt Russell film about um, uh, when the U.S. and Russia... uh, fought on the uh, hockey rinks. And then uh, he also did Warrior. I never saw Warrior, but I've heard a lot of great things about it. So, And Gavin O'Connor also had something come out earlier this year and Jane Got a Gun. Um, that one kind of flopped. But the trailer came out for this. It looked interesting. It looked like it was going to really be a character piece on Ben Affleck's character, have some great action moments, be kind of a cat and mouse game. And was that... I would say so. It was pretty fun. Um, yeah, so without any further ado, let's get real and break down the account. So let's start with the writing and directing. In terms of the writing, this the actual story, one, is non-linear. There's a lot of stuff that keeps hopping around all over the place, and you don't really know what uh, time frame it is, and uh, that kind of adds to the fun of it. Because here's the deal. I don't mind linear films that tell a story from beginning to end, act one, two, and three, very standard. But it's nice every once in a while to sit down and be thrown a curveball and have something play out of order. And you're, you're, the scenes are, are really good and they're compelling and you're trying to figure out like where the hell is this place in the story. Um, so yeah, I, I like that aspect. I know a lot of people are not really digging the whole non-linear aspect of the film, but I really enjoyed it, and it kind of kept me more interested in the story and the plot as it progressed. So with that out of the way, the story itself, kind of generic. Um, It's not like anything like groundbreaking, like, oh my god, there was several twists in there. It was like a really dark, deep message on society. Guys, listen, the story is a very fun, basic tale of someone, you know, on the bad side, laundering money, people are after him, yada, yada, yada. It's, you know, it's like nothing new that we've seen before. So the story itself isn't really compelling, but the way it's told is, and that could be from a director standpoint. So going into the directing, um, I thought for the most part, Gavin O'Connor did a very good job really kind of setting up this character that Ben Affleck is, uh, which is a character that has a high-functioning form of autism. Now, listen, I have never 
been around someone with autism or Asperger's or extreme o- uh, OCD like um, Mr. Wolf does in the movie played by Ben Affleck. But it seems like he really took uh, very good care with this and didn't exploit it, didn't really Hollywoodize it, and really kept it true to his form, which kind of made the made the character more interesting. To be honest with you, if he didn't have that like autism aspect about him, it would just be a generic kind of Jason Bourne ripoff film. But that autistic edge to his character actually adds a lot more depth than you would realize. And you just, you realize that he's doing bad things, but at the same time, this is how he uh, functions in society. And, you know, to him, this is this is just what he does. And he doesn't really think about really the consequences that much. And I, I, just, I found it really, um, like I said, engaging to follow him because it is different from the norm. And I, I thought Gavin O'Connor really kind of created just a really fun, entertaining thriller with some really great kind of, excuse me, family dramatic moments and whatnot. Um, I will say this, though. A director's main job is to get the best performances out of the actors. The weird thing about this movie, and I was thinking about this on the way home, is that the acting is so bad good but it's in such a generic movie like I don't know it's really weird like when you watch the movie you don't know what I'm talking about but everyone is giving it their all and I guess I can jump into the acting right now everyone was giving it their all Ben Affleck holy shit he really dove into that character and you believed everything about him. You believed his past. You believed uh, every piece of dialogue that came out. You believed the badassery when it happened. It's just, it's a really well done character and I think he really kind of sunk into it while really kind of um, being respectful of people with autism and whatnot. It seems like he really took care of this character. Anna Kendrick, I'm not like the biggest fan of her. I liked her in this. She was very likable. J.K. Simmons, pretty awesome in this. John Bernthal, he, what a badass. I mean, he's basically just showing off his Punisher moves. Um, John uh, Lithgow, I mean, he's not like the best or anything, but, I mean, he's fine. Uh, Jeffrey Tambor, I mean, he's barely in there, but he's fine. Um, I, I've, especially J.K. Simmons, there's a part towards the end where you're just like, Dude, this guy is like giving it his all, but it's like it's it's just an okay movie at best. But with the acting, it kind of um, uh, it holds its ground more. So I don't know. It's very weird. Like the acting, I think all around is is very good, even though some of them are very underdeveloped or underused, like a John Lithgow or Jeffrey Tambor. They're fine, but their characters aren't really developed that well. They're or they're very one note, or they're not even in it. At, all um the main focus is Ben Affleck and Anna Kendrick's chemistry um and of course John Bernthal and J.K. Simmons and stuff but everyone does such a good job I believed everything that uh was said I believed all their actions uh I believed all their motives for doing what they're doing and stuff so I think that overall the acting is great except for the under usage of some of the actors and whatnot. But that's, you know, that that's bound to happen when you have a stat cast like this. But Ben Affleck, like I said, this is, um, it's not like going to go down as like one of his best roles in history, but there was a lot there that they scratched on the surface that kept me interested to where if they were to announce a sequel by the end of this weekend, if it crushes at the box office, I'd be totally fucking down to explore this character more. Um, it's just a really interesting kind of backstory when you watch it and stuff and the way he was brought up by his dad and, um, how his dad thought of the world and how he wanted his son to kind of take on the world because of his, uh, uh, disability. And I just, I thought that was, you know, some really good compelling stuff. So if they make a sequel with this character, I'd be totally fucking down to explore that more cinematography wise. Um, was pretty good. I mean, there was not there was no shot that like stuck out to where I was like, "Well, damn, we got some cinematography geniuses up in this motherfucker." No, nothing like that. Um, 
you know, like when I watched like, you know, last week, like Birth of a Nation, there were several shots of cinematography that will stick out and burn into your memory and you will think about it for days on end. This is a serviceable movie. The, the cinematography is not like, you know, oh, whoo, mind-blowing, son. There were a couple of shots that were really interesting, like at the very beginning. It's not really spoiling anything, but, you know, he has autism and uh, OCD and uh, whatnot. So there was a, a really cool shot where he's in his apartment and he's eating uh, his breakfast or whatever or his dinner. And uh, the shot goes out to a wide and all it shows is just this this wall with a square opening and through the square out in the distance is him at the kitchen table to signify that he is alone in the world. And I thought, you know, when you use shots like that, that's really creative. That's really great. Other than that, everything else is serviceable. Um, moving into the editing and special effects slash choreography and all that stuff for the editing wise, the movie's two hours long. I never felt like it dragged once except for one part uh, I'm not going to say what it is or what it entailed. I'm just going to say it's an exposition scene. And it did kind of drag a little bit as it was going. I was like, eh, can we, like, I don't know, get a move on on this. But I think for the most part, that nonlinear aspect kind of keeps the, the mystery up about the story and how it's connected and whatnot to keep you interested as an audience member. And I think the two-hour runtime will seem a lot faster than it does. And then, like I said, the only, like I said, the only slow part was the exposition scene. A little too long. Very well acted. Very kind of, eh, story-wise. But um, it was a little too long. Exposition heavy, if you will. Uh, choreography for all the fight sequences I thought were really well done. There are very, very, very few and far between. And you guys have to realize that. This is not an action film. This is, more, I would consider it more of a drama <laughs> with action thriller moments like that's what I would consider it as it's not a bad thing because it's more about the character and whatnot um but as far as the choreography and the action goes when it does happen it's super cool there are some moves that were performed in some uh uh camera choices and editing techniques that just made the the violence and the action a little visceral and gritty and uh, I felt every single bullet that hit someone or a punch to a head or whatever. So I thought that was really well uh, handled. Um, but like I said, the uh, the most compelling part about this movie is Ben Affleck's character and just the way he functions in society. I think that's some really compelling stuff. And like I said, wouldn't mind seeing a sequel if they move forward. So guys, overall, this is a pretty fun um, drama action thriller. I thought I had some really great performances. Kind of a generic story. Uh, nothing real special. I thought the action was really well handled. A bit, uh, a, there are some characters that are a bit underused or one note or underdeveloped, however you want to call it. And there are a couple, I forgot to mention, but there are a couple, you know, plot elements in this that aren't really explored, you know, as much as you would hope it would be. But I don't know, maybe. They'll realize their mistake and do it better for the sequel. I have no clue. But, I mean, that should always be the rule of thumb. Like, don't make a movie and just expect uh, to answer everything in the sequels. It's okay to leave some off the table. But when you're throwing, like, a bunch of uh, little stuff at you in the, the first movie, doesn't really get solved or whatever. It just it kind of feels a little lazy. But uh, I think overall, this is a fun, entertaining film. Great performances, great care on uh, uh, the autism uh, aspect of it. So I thought overall, you should probably see this in a theater. Um, I, I would say matinee, maybe not really full price. But if you were anxious to see it and anxious to see Ben Affleck kind of continue after his uh, Batman appearance, because hell, that that was the one this year that put him back on the map in a bigger way than ever before. So this is the first one that we get to put under a microscope and examine to see if he can actually uh, continue to carry on these great performances, even after the iconic one that is Bruce Wayne. Oh, and a side note, it was really cool to see JK Simmons and Ben Affleck interact because JK Simmons is commissioner Gordon uh, in the Batman and justice league films. So my grade overall for the accountant guys I was battling on this. <sighs> I think 
okay, I think I, I, I'm good. I'm a, I'm settled on the accountant. I'm gonna give a B minus. Like I said, I would have given it a solid B, but just some of the characters and the ge- the generic nature and whatnot, um, and some of the plot points that were just didn't really go anywhere uh, and whatnot. Uh, that's why I had to drop it. Um, other than that, I would have given it a B. But I think a B minus is still pretty good for this film. B minus B. Uh, shit, guys, this is literally the the closest I've ever recorded an episode after a viewing. Um, so I'm still debating myself, but I'm recording this live. I got to tell you guys a score. I think I'll stick with my B minus. I think it's, um, it's good. It's solid. So there you go. So have you guys seen the account or have you even heard of it? Comment that place wrote my face and let me know. Um, like I said, I'm not doing box office results this weekend. However, I could guess the top five. And if you're listening to this, um, um, on Sunday or after Sunday, and I'm wrong, and then you can laugh about it. Tell your friends that you you just met the biggest jackass on the the internet. I don't. I don't know. This is really tough. I think the account will be number one. You know, probably hit about thirty thirty five. I think number two will be the girl on the train. I think number three will be. Um, Number three will probably be Miss Peregrine's home for peculiar children, uh, young X Men, Tim Burton uh, extravaganza film. Um, number four, I probably go Deep Water Horizon. Number five, unfortunately, Birth of a Nation is probably not going to be in there. Um, number five, number five, number five, probably Storks maybe. Yeah, I'm gonna go with that. So that's my prediction, guys. It's pretty shitty. So there you go. Uh, next week, guys. Uh, well, that will do it for uh, this week's episode. Uh, but for next week, for episode 152, um, for the next two weeks, I'm not going to be reviewing new releases because guess what? All of them suck. They look like they're going to suck a huge pile of dicks. So um, I'm going to be doing uh, two special episode still have the movie news and the trailers and whatnot but for the main topic uh for next week i'm going to be doing horror comedies the best horror comedies some of the worst horror comedies just horror comedies in general uh because fuck medea's boo halloween special fucking shit thing is coming out next week and so i figure i just honor the horror comedies and film and then the last weekend in October, I am not seeing Inferno because I did not care for Angels and Demons or Da Vinci Code that much. So you guys are shit out of luck that week. I'm kidding. For the last week in October, um, I for sure have a guest. Um, keep, it, keep it a surprise for you guys. But the last weekend is going to be uh, the best uh, horror films to watch on Halloween. So the ba- basically the best movies to watch on Halloween. So, uh, yeah, that will be the last week in October and then, uh, move it on to, uh, November. So the next two weeks, no new releases guys. Cause they all look like garbage. So, but I will still give you guys episodes. So guys, I want to thank you for uh, listening. This is a very short episode this week. I know I apologize, but it kind of makes up for it. Cause last week was damn near three hours. So, I figure I'd give you a shorter one this week. You know, it balances out a little bit. Balances out the universes, and we're all calm now. So, if you guys want to follow me on Twitter, it's at Real Chase Lee. Uh, subscribe to my YouTube page. Follow me on Spreaker. Subscribe on iTunes. Write a review. Tell your friends. Spread it around. I'm also on iHeartRadio and SoundCloud. Listen, guys, I, I know I say this every week, but you guys are really... Uh, the reason I keep this going, all the listeners out there, you guys are so fucking awesome. Please keep doing what you're doing and spread this podcast around and let people know about it if they can stomach (laughs) a raunchy douchebag on the internet. So, um, yeah, next week, 152, horror comedies. And, hey, listen, if you made it through this entire podcast and you are not a movie fan, well, hopefully I convinced you to be one. The intro and outro music is done by my friend's band, Fervent Rose. Check them out. Link in the description below. All the links are in the description below. And speaking of that music, peace out, everyone. See you next week.